questions to the Prime Minister. Esther McVeigh. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Thank you. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm sure members across the whole House will wish to join me in marking Anti-Slavery Day. This is an abhorrent crime, and I'm determined to bring it to an end. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Esther McVeigh. Can the Prime Minister reaffirm her government's commitment to the Northern Powerhouse? Could she set out the specific schemes? The Honourable Lady has never been silenced, and as far as I'm concerned, she never will be. Esther McVeigh. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The importance of the North will be heard. And could the Prime Minister set out the schemes she she seeks to prioritise? And would she agree with me that the only Norths that are in tune with the leader of the opposition's political correctness and Marxism is Islington North and North Korea? We've got a lot of questions to get through, and I want to hear the Prime Minister's answer. I ask colleagues to contain themselves. We've got 32 questions that I want to get through. Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My uh, right honourable friend referred to the voice of the North being heard, and it has indeed been heard by the Conservatives in Government. That's why, that's why it is a Conservative Government that committed and remains committed to the Northern Powerhouse. It's why it's a Conservative Government that is putting in the investment in skills and transport infrastructure into the Northern Powerhouse. And we're backing business growth across the North, as I saw when I visited the North West last week. £60 million pounds into, uh, to transport for the North for looking at the uh, Northern Powerhouse rail. Uh, we're putting, that's part of £13 billion infrastructure investment that's going in. It's the Conservatives in government that recognise the importance of a country that works for everyone and growth across the whole country. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I joined the Prime Minister in, in recognising Anti-Slavery Day and recognising that the slave trade was one of the gross, most grotesque times in the history of this planet and we must all be resolved to drive out slavery in any form whatsoever. I hope the Prime Minister will join me in expressing sympathy, solidarity and support for the people of Somalia following the horrific terrorist atrocity in Mogadishu last weekend. Mr Speaker, I welcome today's fall in unemployment. Mr. Speaker, but, Mr. Speaker, the same figures show that real wages are lower today than they were 10 years ago. Most people in work are worse off. Does the Prime Minister really believe falling wages are a sign of a strong economy? Prime Minister. First of all, can I join the Right Honourable Gentleman in expressing our concern uh, at the terrible terrorist attack that took place in Mogadishu? As we know, it killed nearly 300 people and uh, many hundreds were injured. And uh, terrorism in Somalia undermines the stability of the Horn of Africa. And we will continue to work with the international community to try and bring stability to Somalia and to that part of Africa. And of course, part of that is dealing with the terrorist threat that they face there. Um, the Right Honourable Gentleman, I think, may actually have done a first yes. in the House of Commons today. Because I think it is the first time, since, certainly since I became Prime Minister, that he's actually welcomed a fall in unemployment. It is good news that more people are in work. It is good news that the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate is at 
is at its lowest level for over 40 years. That does mean more money being taken uh, in wages by people to their families. And he asks about the cost of living, and I'll tell him what we've done in relation to the cost of living. 30 million people have been given a tax cut that's, that's worth £1,000 to a basic rate taxpayer every year. We have given the low paid through the national living wage the highest pay increase for 20 years. And for those who take the full entitlement, doubling free, uh, free childcare is worth £5,000 per child per year to every family. That's what we're doing to help people with the cost of living. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I wonder if the Prime Minister could do a first and answer a question. Yeah. The question I asked her was about falling wages. And this week, Mr Speaker, Christine, a worker in a village shop, wrote to me saying this, I am worse off. I cannot afford to keep my car, which I struggle to buy, on the road. I need my car to attend appointments, job hunt for a better position and take my son to activities. We don't have a luxurious lifestyle and we don't want one. We just want to feel secure. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when millions of workers are having to rely on the benefit system just to make ends meet, yeah. isn't that a sign not of a strong economy but of a weak economy? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. I recognise that, like Christine, there are people in, the, in this country who are finding life difficult. I have recognised that since I came into this role. But that is, why, that, is why, that is why it is so important that government takes steps to help people with the cost of living, uh, with the costs that they find themselves facing uh, week in and week out. It is why the measures that I have just listed to the right hon. Gentleman in tax cuts and uh, national living wage are important. It is why it is important, for example, we have frozen fuel duty. We have ensured that uh, we have taken some people who are the lowest paid out of paying income tax altogether. We are going to introduce an energy price cap. This is all about helping people with... Yes, yes. It's all about helping people with the cost of living. But you can only do that if you have a strong economy, and you only get a strong economy with a Conservative government. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, people struggling to make ends meet, private sector rental evictions up, wages down, universal credit in a shambles. Is Christine wrong or is she just an example of what it's like living in modern Britain? Mr Speaker, last week I asked the Prime Minister to scrap the unfair charges on the universal credit helpline. Today she's finally bowed to that pressure. But the fundamental problems of universal credit remain. Yeah. The six-week wait, yeah. rising indebtedness, rent arrears and evictions. Will the Prime Minister now pause universal credit yeah. and fix the problems before pressing ahead with the rollout? Yeah. Prime Minister. Yes, uh, it is absolutely right. to the Honourable Member for Brent Central before she's an aspiring stateswoman and must <laughs> conduct herself with due decorum. Come. Again, maybe the Honourable Lady is another member who should take up yoga. <laughs> the Prime Minister. I suggest to Honourable Members opposite that they listen to the whole sentence that I was going to make. Yes, it is absolutely right that we have announced this morning that we are going to change uh, in relation to the, uh, the, the telephone uh, charge that is made on people here. I think this is. I think this is. Uh, I said last week that we were listening to a number of uh, proposals that have been made. We have done that, and it's also. 
I think it's right to have done this now because there's a lot of emphasis, a lot of publicity around universal credit at the moment. I want people to know that they can ring in, that they can get their advice and that they can do that without being worried about it. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But the Right Honourable Gentleman talks about universal credit and talks about pausing universal credit. Why have we introduced universal credit? It's a simpler system. It's a system that encourages people to get into the workplace. It is a system that is working because more people are getting into work. And pausing universal credit won't help those people who will be helped by going to universal credit, getting into the workplace and bringing home more pay for their families. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, there is a very long list of people urging the Prime Minister to pause universal credit, including the Citizens Advice Bureau, the Trussell Trust, John Major and, I understand, two dozen of our own backbenchers. Well, they've got a chance this afternoon. They can vote to pause universal credit and show that they are representing their, their constituents. The public sector pay cap, Mr Speaker, is causing real suffering and real staff shortages. Last week, the Health Secretary announced the NHS pay cap was scrapped. But when asked if the NHS is going to get extra money to fund any agreed pay rise, he replied, that is something I can't answer right now. Well, this is right now. The Prime Minister is here right now. How about an answer right now? Prime Minister. As I have explained to the Right Honourable Gentleman and the House in the past, uh, the way in which we approach the whole question of public sector pay is by, through the work of the pay review bodies. They have all reported for this current year. They did that against the remit that was set by government of a blanket cap of 1% in relation to public sector pay. For the 2018-19 year, we have changed that uh, remit. What we have done is to ensure that there is flexibility in the system for that, for that period. But perhaps I could just explain something else to the right honourable gentleman, because I fear that for all his years in Parliament there is one thing that he has failed to recognise. Government has no money of its own. Government gets money. Oh dear. Mr McNeil, you're becoming overexcitable again, young man. Calm yourself. No need for excessive gesticulation. It serves no useful purpose whatsoever. Let's hear the Prime Minister's reply. Prime Minister will be heard, however long it takes. Prime Minister. Government has no money of its own. Of its own. It collects money in taxes from businesses and people to pay, to spend to spend on the NHS and on the services that people need. If businesses aren't being set up, if businesses aren't growing, if people aren't in work, government doesn't have the money to spend on NHS pay, on schools and hospitals. And, of course, the only way, the only way you ensure those businesses are growing, the only way you ensure that people are in jobs, that government has the money to spend on schools and hospitals and NHS pay, is with a Conservative government. Jeremy Corbyn. The Prime Minister seemed to have no problem finding a billion pounds in a couple of days for the DUP. She needs to make it clear. She needs to make it clear, Mr Speaker to the NHS workers what pay rise is being offered, when they will receive it and what funding is being provided and what cuts she is proposing to make elsewhere in order to deal with that. Mr Speaker, young people are in record levels of debt. This week, the Financial Conduct Authority warned, and I quote, of a pronounced build-up of indebtedness amongst a younger age group to fund essential living costs. Isn't this yet another sign, not of a strong economy, but of a weak economy? Prime Minister. This is, this is, I have to say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, we have heard from the OECD that the deficit that the Labour government left us was unsustainable. Since then, since then, since then, we have indeed, we have indeed found money for the people of Northern Ireland. We've also found, as I was explaining earlier, 
£20 billion to, take, to give a tax cut to 30 million people and £38 billion to uh, freeze fuel duty. That is about helping ordinary working people day in and day out. And when it comes to students and young people and their fear about debt, there is one thing we know, and that is we should not be racking up debts today like Labour proposed that those young people would have to pay off tomorrow. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, it's very interesting that she talks about what happened uh, ten years ago. Her former friend George Osborne said earlier this week, did Gordon Brown cause the subprime crisis in America? No. He went on to say, broadly speaking, the government did what was necessary in a very difficult situation. <laughs> Mr Speaker. Under this Prime Minister, under this Prime Minister, we have a weak economy. Yeah. UK growth is currently the worst amongst the ten largest EU economies. We're the only major economy where wages are lower today than they were ten years ago. Even without the risks posed by this government's bungled Brexit negotiations. Yeah. It's very interesting the Home Secretary is necessary to keep the two protagonists apart. <laughs> Mr Speaker, we now have weak growth, falling productivity, falling investment, falling wages. How does the Prime Minister have the nerve to come here and talk about a strong economy when the figures show the exact opposite? To the, uh, to the right honourable gentleman. The OECD says about the United Kingdom we have the most efficient, accessible healthcare system, fiscal sustainability has improved, important steps have been taken to improve educational outcomes, and jobs and earnings are good. That's what the OECD says about the strong economy under this Conservative government. The way, the way to get a weak economy is to borrow £500 billion like the Labour Party is proposing. The way, to get, the way to get a weak economy is to ensure that you are promising spending after spending after spending, and people are going to have to pay for that. The only way you get money to put into public services, the only way we can give people tax cuts to help them with the cost of living, is to ensure we deal with the deficit, get our debts down, and deal with Labour's great recession, which put us into this position in the first place. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following the rather flaccid response from the Leader of the Opposition, can I welcome the announcement, welcome the announcement that this Government is scrapping the Universal Credit Helpline charges, a move which demonstrates that pe this Government is supporting people who want to get up, work hard and get on in life. Can the Prime Minister now confirm that all welfare claim DWP Helpline charges will be completely free to all claimants? Yeah. I am very happy to uh, confirm that, and perhaps it is uh, it's useful to be able to do that. The, my right hon. Friend, the Work and Pension Secretary, announced this morning that we have taken that decision to change the Universal Credit Helpline to a free phone number, but I can also tell my hon. Friend that by the end of the year, DWP will be extending free phone numbers to all of their phone lines. I think that will be welcomed and will be helpful to all those using them. And Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister do today what our Brexit Secretary was unable to do in this chamber yesterday and rule out a no-deal scenario on leaving the EU? Yeah. Prime Minister! I can confirm that what we are doing is working for the best possible deal for the United Kingdom. But, but, it would be irresponsible of government not to prepare for all possible scenarios. And that's exactly what we're doing. Graham Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I point out to her that what our Home Secretary said yesterday, that a no deal is unthinkable. Mm -hmm. I agree with the Home Secretary. Exactly. Mr yeah. Speaker, Brexit has contributed to a fall in the pound and a subsequent rise in inflation, squeezing household budgets. Folk are getting poorer in Britain today. It has been reported that government analysis shows that Scotland and the north-east of England 
would lose out from Brexit. But the government responded to an FOI by saying that such analysis. Well, Mr. Speaker, there is hilarity. Order! 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 Uh, a government whip from Staffordshire. He's forgetting his manners, he's gesticulating rather noisily. He should calm himself. Let's hear Mr. Blackford. Well, Mr. Speaker, the government benches are engaging in hilarity. The reality is that the people in this country are going to pay an economic price yep. for a hard Brexit. Exactly. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, the analysis from the government, which has remained secret, points out that people in Scotland and the north east of England will suffer from a hard Brexit. What is the government's analysis of the impact, and what will be the impact? Yeah, yeah. Order, order! I say to the honourable gentleman, Helian and Yar, I know what I am doing. I am trying to help the honourable gentleman, but the honourable gentleman must help himself by asking a brief question. I think he has order. I think the honourable gentleman has completed his question. No. Well, a last sentence. Order, order, a last sentence, and it had better be very brief. A very last sentence, far too long. Come on, quickly. What is the government's analysis of the impact of Brexit on a no-deal scenario? Yeah. Thank you. The Prime Minister. Can I say to the... Uh, can, I, can I say to the, the right honourable gentleman... Um, he once again stands up and talks about the Scottish economy. He once again re makes reference to, and there are issues like jobs in Scotland. I'm sorry that in his rather lengthy question, he did not make any reference to the fact that since 2010, nearly a quarter of a million more people in Scotland are in work. That is a result of the actions of this government. Now we're going to hear backbenchers. Backbenchers in this place must be heard. Mr Martin Vickers. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. As the uh, Prime Minister pointed out in the answer to the first question, the Northern Powerhouse Initiative has done a great deal to help the economies in, in northern areas. But our coastal communities are desperately in need of further investment and support. In North East Lincolnshire, we have established a project board, uh, private sector led, which includes expertise, uh, members that include a former Chancellor and a former Head of the Civil Service. Could the uh, Prime Minister give us support to uh, the initiative for a town deal for North East Lincolnshire, which might provide a model for other areas? Prime Minister. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for, for raising this, and I uh, recognise and understand there are ambitious regeneration plans being developed by the Greater Grimsbury uh, Project Board. And uh, I welcome that because that is based on a very strong private public sector approach and partnership that is being put forward. And I know my honourable friend is himself playing an active role role in that. I believe there have been some positive meetings with my right honourable friend the Community Secretary and my honourable friend the Northern Powerhouse Minister, and I would encourage the Board to continue that engagement with officials about the details of their plans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At the general election, both main parties committed to an energy price cap. The Government have now published a bill for which I believe there is strong cross-party support. So will the 14 million customers on standard variable tariffs actually see their energy prices come down this winter? And if not, when will the Prime Minister get onto the statute books legislation to ensure that this is the last winter where customers can be ripped off by their energy company? Yeah. Well, I uh, I'm welcome the fact that the Honourable Lady says that she and others on uh, the Labour benches will support the legislation that the Government has... It is, it is important that we take action to deal with the energy prices. Um, the, draft legislation, the draft legislation will see those rip-off prices being capped for millions uh, of households to all standard tariff uh, customers. And while it will initially, this will initially run to 2020, we will be able to extend it on an annual basis until 2023 on the advice of Ofgen. I think we have sent an important message to the industry. I would hope that they are actually going to make changes even before we get the legislation on the statute book. Fiona Bruce. Does the Prime Minister share the grave concerns which were expressed in this House yesterday, including by ministers, of the implications for the one country, two systems principle in Hong Kong at the recent refusal of the authorities there 
to disallow Ben Rogers, a UK national, entry? And will the Prime Minister confirm that the government will work with the Hong Kong and Chinese authorities to ensure that the democratic freedoms in the one country, two systems principle are honoured and preserved? Yeah. Prime Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right that we want to ensure that that principle of one country and two systems is preserved and it continues to operate. Uh, on the specific case and the specific issue that she has raised, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, informs me that the Foreign Office has raised this issue at various levels uh, in relation to uh, Hong Kong and China, and we will continue to do so. Yeah. Margaret Greenwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I refer members to my register of interest. People in my constituency, many of whom work at Vauxhall's Ellesmere pork plant, are devastated by the announcement of 400 job losses yeah. this week. Yeah. PSA stated that clarity on the UK's future trading relationship with the EU was needed before the company would be in a position to consider future investment at Vauxhall. Cabinet ministers have plenty to say to each other about Brexit, but what has the government got to say to the 400 workers at Vauxhall Ellesmere Port who face losing their jobs in the run-up to yeah. Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, that, of course, we never want to see people in the position of losing their jobs and support if people do lose their jobs. Support is there available to them through the DWP to help them get back into the, uh, into the labour market and to get back into work. We are in the process of a negotiation on Brexit. We will leave the European Union in March 2019, and we are negotiating for the best possible deal we can for the United Kingdom. We have also indicated that we want an implementation period after that deal has been negotiated to ensure that businesses don't place a cliff edge, that they can have certainty about the rules in which they're going to operate in the future. But if there is one thing that is certain, it is that we will leave the EU in March 2019. Sir Richard Bacon. Mr Speaker. <laughs> Self build and custom house building act is now on the statute book. Yeah. 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 It is a very good piece of legislation, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Could the Prime Minister confirm that the Community House uh, Home Building Fund, available last year for group housing projects, is still available. Does she agree that providing service plots of land at scale is a good way to fix our broken housing market? Uh, my honourable friend has raised an important point, and I know that he has campaigned long and hard on this particular area of uh, self-build, and of course has a great deal of, uh, of expertise in it. And he's absolutely right. If we're going to fix our broken housing market, we do need to build more homes. And that's why we've made bold proposals in our housing white paper to make more land available, to build homes faster, to give local authorities the tools they need. I had a, a, a roundtable with house builders and others earlier this week looking at how we can ensure that we unlock the potential of our housing market. And I'm sure my right honourable friend, the Community Secretary, will be happy to discuss the very specific issues that he's raised with him. With George. Thank you. Prime Minister, you said that universal credit is working. I wonder what you would say to my constituent, Fred, who claimed universal credit for a short time over two years ago and has been working ever since, but suddenly got a letter in August demanding he repay £366. Despite spending hours on the phone line, Fred was not told why he was being charged, and over £100 a month was taken out of his wages, meaning he incurred bank charges. Will you take personal responsibility to that no more claimants suffer injustice and debt as Fred has? I will take no responsibility for these matters myself at all, and the Honourable Lady will be advised on the protocol, but the Prime Minister may wish to respond. Well, as uh, I've indicated and in the changes that have been made in relation to the phone line, but I repeat to the Honourable Lady, universal, well, the evidence shows that on universal credit more people are getting into the workplace than on job seekers' allowance. Universal credit is about helping people to get into the workplace and about ensuring that as they earn more, then they keep more of what they're earning, and that's exactly what universal credit does. David Trudinick. Is my right honourable friend aware of the wonderful work at Twycross Zoo in my constituency breeding endangered species? But is she also aware 
of the critical problem of the demise of African elephants who are being slaughtered at the rate of 20,000 a year. What is she going to do about banning ivory sales in London? Yes, my, my honourable friend raises an important point. First of all, may I commend those in his constituency who are doing this uh, valuable work. Uh, we did earlier this month set out proposals for a ban on ivory sales that we believe will help to bring an end to the poaching of elephants, and that would put the UK uh, front and centre of global efforts to end the global trade in ivory. I'm sure across this House people are concerned about this particular issue, and uh, ivory shouldn't be seen as a commodity for financial gain or a status symbol. What we are proposing to do, I think, will make a real difference. Thank Universal credit is not just a benefit for job seekers, it is for people in work to subsidise their low pay, for carers and for those that cannot work. My constituents in North West Durham have endured the brunt of austerity for many years. Now, the DWP proposes to roll out the universal credit system in my constituency over Christmas, the toughest financial time for residents. My question to the Prime Minister is this. Is the rollout a matter of gross incompetence or calculated cruelty? The DWP has been rolling out universal credit. As it has done so, it has been listening to people about the concerns that have been raised. I am pleased to say that we are seeing a much better performance from the DWP. It is no good the Honourable Lady shaking her head. The figures show show that the performance in terms of getting payments to people on time has increased substantially. Uh, More people are getting advance payments, and we want to ensure that all those who need those advance payments are indeed able to get those payments. But the fundamental uh, reason for moving to universal credit, of a simpler system, a more straightforward... Well, she may not want to listen to this, but there is a reason for universal credit. There is a reason for... Order. Colleagues know that I am determined to get through the list to help back benches, but when questions are asked, the answers must be heard, and today is exceptionally noisy, and we are not setting a very good example to our Dutch friends. I am sure they do it much better. Now, the questions will be heard, and the Prime Minister's answers will be heard. The Prime Minister. I just simply finally, finally say to the Honourable Lady, the purpose for a universal credit is a more straightforward, simpler system that helps people to keep more as they earn more and encourages more people into work, and that is what it is doing. Victoria Prentice. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, it's great to have the Prime Minister back in her usual fine voice. Yeah. So, yeah. Will she join with me? who themselves have demonstrated what good voices they have in encouraging them to hold events for singing for Syrians in their own constituencies. The situation on the ground in Syria gets ever more desperate, and I am sorry to say that the Hands Up Foundation, who do great work, have an ever-increasing list for, pro- pro- for prosthetic limbs. The Prime Minister. Can I first of all say to my honourable friend that I think we all recognise the desperate situation in Syria, and that's why we continue to be proud of the record that we have as a country for the humanitarian aid that we have given uh, to Syria and to the refugees from Syria. And that's 2.46 billion that's been committed since 2012, which is our largest ever response to humanitarian crisis. But I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in encouraging members of this House to support the Singing for Syrian initiative and the various events throughout the country. This is another important initiative focused, as our humanitarian aid is, on helping those people who are in a desperate situation in Syria. Lillian Greenwood. Speaker, Notts Fire Service tell us sprinklers save lives. Nottingham City Council plan to retrofit sprinklers in all their high-rise blocks. But this government won't provide a penny to support them. After Grenfell, the Prime Minister promised we cannot and will not ask people to live in unsafe homes. Mm. How safe would she feel living on the 20th floor of Pineview or South Church Court Mm. in my constituency with one staircase and no sprinklers? 
Prime Minister. First of all, say to the Honourable Lady that much has been said in this House since the Grenfell Tower fire about the issue of sprinklers. There are a number of aspects that have to be looked at in relation to the safety of tower blocks, and uh, it is not the case that sprinklers is the only issue that needs to be listened, looked at or can be addressed or the only solution to ensuring the safety of those tower blocks. And in relation to the expenditure uh, of, uh, by her local council, it is, of course, up to the council to make the decisions about which they, what they wish to do. But we have been, we've been, we've been very clear uh, that discussions have taken place with the DCLG and local authorities on this. Courts! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the mental health of our service men, women, and their families is rightly gaining the attention it yeah, deserves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, would the Prime Minister join with me in welcoming the initiative between the Royal Foundation and the Ministry of Defence, ensuring targeted support across the whole Armed Forces family? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very, very happy to welcome the initiative that my honourable friend has referred to. Mental health is an issue that we know we need to address more uh, carefully and uh, with greater attention across the public in general. But the issue of uh, mental health uh, concerns for those who are in the armed forces and those who have left the armed forces is a very real challenge that we need to face because they have put themselves on the line for us and we owe it to them. Dr Alan Whitehead. Major Southampton Housing Association tells me that 65 per cent of their tenants who are on universal credit are now in major rent arrears averaging £700, hampering the association's ability to get on with building new houses. What message has the Prime Minister got for my local housing association? Is it just tough, get on with it, or has she got something more positive to say? Prime Minister! To the Honourable Gentleman, that we are indeed giving support to housing associations to build more homes. That is why, in the, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we announced the extra £2 billion that is going to housing associations to enable them to do exactly that. David Amos! Would my right honourable friend agree with me that, with the death of Sir Teddy Taylor, the country has lost an out standing parliamentarian, great constituency member of parliament and true patriot. And would my right honourable friend further agree with me that if Sir Teddy was alive today, he would be delighted to learn that the outgoing Labour Mayor of South End plus three unaligned councillors have all joined the Conservative Party. <laughs> Can I first of all uh, join my honourable friend in recognising the great contribution that Sir Teddy Taylor made in his time in this House, uh, standing uh, as Member of Parliament for different seats, but of course including uh, the South End seat. Although I do have to say to my honourable friend, one of my abiding memories of Sir Teddy Taylor is the number of times we had to evacuate Portcullis House because he'd set the fire alarm off by smoking when he wasn't supposed to in his, uh, in his office. But I'm very pleased to welcome the former Labour Mayor uh, and the unaligned councillors who have now uh, joined the Conservative Party. We welcome them to the Conservative Party and look forward to working with them. Julie Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, government failure to fund schools adequately is hurting children in my constituency. In Lancashire, Lancashire schools will lose £40 million worth of funding and 828 teachers by 2020. Can the Prime Minister explain to me how this is going to help raise standards and aspirations? Prime Minister! I'll tell the Honourable Lady what is helping with standards and aspirations. First of all, the fact that this Government is putting record funding into our schools. And secondly, secondly, the reforms that we have brought about in our education system that mean already that over 100 150,000 children are at good or in outstanding schools yeah. in the Honourable Member's area, an increase of nearly 40,000 since 2010. Yeah. More children in good or outstanding schools, that's what this Government is providing. Yeah. Mr Speaker, earlier on this year I opened a state-of-the-art manufacturing training facility at Braintree's Further Education College. On Friday I opened a new training centre for CSS, a family-run uh, family business. Now that unemployment is at record low and employment is at record high, 
Will the government commit to supporting both public and private sector trainers to increase productivity in the British economy? Uh, well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Increasing productivity is a key aim of our government. It's very important for us, for our economy, for the future. Investing in skills is a key part of that. I'm pleased to hear that my honourable friend has been so active in opening new facilities in his, uh, in his constituency. But the changes we're making in supporting FE colleges and the new T level skills, uh, T levels, and the uh, emphasis we're putting £500 million into technical education will all help to increase the skills levels of young people in this country. Jen Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Uh, the Trust for London's latest poverty profile shows that levels of homelessness in Enfield have risen by 82% in the last two years alone, and the eviction rate is the highest in the capital. Uh, can the Prime Minister tell me what hope she is going to give to my constituents? They are in work in the private rented sector. What hope can she give them that they can achieve their reasonable aspiration for themselves and their children to live in a safe, secure, affordable home? Prime hey. Minister! I'll tell the Honourable Lady what hope we are giving to people. It's precisely why I sat with house builders, housing associations and others in No. 10 Downing Street earlier this week to encourage a faster rate of building houses and homes in this country so that more people can reach their aspiration of having a safe and secure home. Uh, it's why we're putting £500 million over a period of years into dealing with the issue of homelessness. But it's all very well her standing up here in this House and asking the Government what we're doing. We're putting more money into house building. She should be asking the Labour Mayor of London what he's doing. Lucy Fraser! Yesterday, the Director General of MI5 said that inter internet companies had an ethical responsibility to deal with the terrorist material online. The Prime Minister has previously indicated that if they do not meet this challenge, she will consider regulation. Can she confirm that if regulations are necessary, they will be robust and enforced? Well, I'm very happy to give my honourable friend that confirmation. Uh, but I also, uh, before we get to that stage, very important work has been done by my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, with the tech companies to ensure that they have uh, they've come together, they've formed a global forum that is looking at how they can deal with this terrorist material on the internet. It is uh, a real issue that we need to address. I was pleased with President Macron and Prime Minister Gentiloni at uh, the United Nations General Assembly in the margins uh, this year to hold a, uh, uh, an event which was at which were, there are representatives of, I think, over 70 countries and representatives of all the major tech companies dealing with exactly this issue. We need to work together, but I want those tech companies to recognise their social and moral responsibility to work with us to do something about this. Nelly! Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister notice I am wearing a red card in my pocket today? She will be aware that the Honourable Member for Murray is not in his place. Indeed, he is in Barcelona doing his other job, today of all days. What signal does she think this sends to hard-working members of the public who are expected to turn up for their day jobs or face sanctions? Yeah. So, order, I trust the Honourable Gen order. Order. I trust the honourable gentleman notified the member for Murray in advance of his intention to raise this question. He did. I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman for that confirmation. The Prime Minister. I have to say to the honourable gentleman that I think uh, the constituents of Moray will be very pleased that they have a Conservative member of Parliament who is seeing their interest in, in this House. And I can say to the and I can say to the honourable gentleman that the Conservatives. The Scottish Conservative members are doing more for the interests of Scotland in this Parliament than the Scottish Nationalists have ever done. Mr Spencer, what's the matter with you, my dear fellow? You eat home-produced food, you're a very respected farmer, you're normally of a most taciturn disposition. I don't know what's come over you. Perhaps you should go and have a rest later. You, you must cheer up. Cheer up. Mr. Philip Davis. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> along, along with the SMT, the Labour Party have said that they will not accept no deal with the EU under any circumstances at all. That means they would pay whatever final bill the EU demands, 
and accept any conditions that they insisted upon. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that nobody with even an ounce of common sense would enter into a negotiation by announcing that in advance? And does she agree with me that the stance proposed by the Labour Party and the SNP is not a negotiation, it's a capitulation? friend has put it very well indeed. You don't enter the negotiations by taking the stance that the Labour Party and the SNP have taken, because as my honourable friend says, that their rejection, their rejection of a no deal means that they would accept a deal at any price to the British taxpayer, whatever the damage that would do to our economy, and we will not do that. David Crosby! Skill job losses at British Aerospace in Lancashire. And more at Vauxhall in Ellesmere Port, redundancies at Alstom in Preston and Monarch in Manchester. So what's happened to the Northern Powerhouse? Has its battery gone flat? And will the Prime Minister recharge it like she quite rightly did in Northern Ireland? Prime Minister. Well, gentlemen, as I indicated to my uh, right honourable friend, the member for Tatton, the government is committed to the Northern Powerhouse and is indeed putting money into the Northern Powerhouse to encourage the uh, economic growth there, particularly through the money we're putting into infrastructure. There are a number of cases, as he has uh, raised. Of course, the issue of Vauxhall was raised by one of his honourable friends earlier, and we're continuing to work with Vauxhall throughout the process to do all that we can to protect United Kingdom jobs, as we have done with BAE. And as we, uh, we are doing with others. But what matters is that we ensure we have the economy that can see more jobs being created and three million more people are in work today than were in 2010. Andrew Salou. Respectful and committed family relationships reduce poverty, improve well-being and help the government to live within its means and are a key part of a country that works for everyone. So will the Prime Minister implement the proposals in the recently published Family Manifesto? Well done. Prime well, Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend for his uh, question on this issue. And he is absolutely right. Uh, and we are, of course, looking at what more we can do to ensure that we do see those stable families, which has the benefits that he has, uh, that he has said. And this is an issue on which my honourable friend has campaigned since he came into his house into this house and I welcome the valuable contribution that he's made on this issue. Last but never forgotten, Mr Dennis Skinner. Is the Prime Minister aware that INEOS, the fracking company, have been accused in the Bolsover area on the Oxcroft estate of creating a massive deterioration in the water supply run by Seven Trent? Will she, as Prime Minister, investigate this matter and call upon INEOS to halt the process whilst the investigation takes place? Prime Minister. I say to the uh, honourable gentleman, he's raised an issue which, of course, I'm sure will be properly looked into, but underlying this is the question of ensuring that we are able to get a secure and safe supply of uh, energy into the future. And that's why the fracking is continuing. That's why we're supportive of the shale gas exploration. There are opportunities there for the United Kingdom, but I'm sure he's raised a particular issue which I'm sure will be looked into appropriately. Thank you. Order. 